first in a series uh, of webinars. We call them Learner Lunch because they're around lunchtime. And we're going to run these approximately every two weeks. And uh, the content will be coming from our masterclasses and boot camps. Uh, and today we'll be talking about the many applications of artificial intelligence. Um, and we have Aubrey Dunn uh, from Robotica Technologies with us here today. Um, you might be seeing him on, on the screen. I'll make sure that, that he, he gets the, 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 full, the full screen just in just a minute. So before the talk, uh, a little bit of context about Talent Garden. Talent Garden is, is the leading European digital innovation hub and co-working ecosystem. We started in Brescia in Italy about 10 years ago, but now we are in 18 European countries where we're hosting over three and a half thousand digital professionals in our 23 campuses across eight countries. And last year, 2018, we opened in Dublin. <coughs> and, um, and you might be wondering, uh, wait a second. and you might be wondering why, uh, why a co-working space is hosting uh, is hosting talks about AI and other hot topics. But, uh, oh, sorry, I'll just, I see that not everyone is muted when, when they join. One second. Oh. Okay. I think we actually managed to, to mute most people here. Okay. Sorry for that. So you might be wondering why uh, a co-working space is also hosting talks about hot topics, but uh, Talangan is not only a co-working space because we also have the innovation school. And um, at the core of Talangan is innovation and education. And we think that is core to developing our tech community. So therefore we have the innovation school who offers uh, training in digital skills. The uh, school opened in November last year where we deliver courses in data science and leadership and UX design digital sales and marketing, and also AI, which we're gonna be diving into today. Our previous clients include IKEA, Grant Thornton, British Telecom, Novartis, among many others. So why this webinar? Um, the idea with these, this series is to share fragments of our upcoming courses. This, uh, this time around is called AI Ready, and we're running it on May 17th. If you're interested, I'll be posting a link to it in the comments. You can also find it in your Google Calendar invite. And AI Ready is a one day course for leaders who want to get a good grasp of artificial intelligence and they want to know how to apply it to their own business. So we are demystifying what artificial intelligence is all about. And it's gonna be a mix of lectures and workshops so you get to work on your own business and apply AI to your own business. If you're interested in learning more about the course, uh, I'll make sure to post a couple of links um, wherever you might be able to see in the comments and also in the, in the email going out to you afterwards. So we have uh, made sure the last 10 to 15 minutes are dedicated to Q&A. So if you have any questions, just post them in the comments, click, uh, hover your mouse on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat, click on that one. And there you will you'll be able to see uh, a chat and you can just type to everyone. I'll make sure to collect the comments uh, and post them to, to Aubrey at the end of our session. Without further ado, I'll introduce our speaker for today, Aubrey Dunn. Aubrey is the Vice President of Engineering at Ubotica Technologies. It's a computer vision and AI startup based here in DCU Alpha in Glasnevin, just in our backyard. Uh, on a daily basis, Aubrey manages strategic planning with Ubotica's international and multinational customers and partners. Ubotica Technologies specializes in AI processing at the network edge, utilizing the Intel Movidius Myriad chip in a range of edge-based applications. Prior to his role in Ubotica, Aubrey completed 10 years of professional engineering consultancy, sorry, in engineering consultancy in the core areas of computer vision and embedded systems design, consulting for Movidius, Intel, and European Space Agency. Aubrey holds a PhD in computer vision and a master's of engineering and a bachelor's of engineering in uh, all from Dublin City University. Um, and now I'll leave the word uh, to Aubrey and um, as I said, uh, please just write your questions in the, in the chat on the, on the right. And um, yeah, let's, let's take it away. Let's start. Okay. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. You can hear me okay, Marius? And yeah, you're just fine. Yeah, good stuff. Okay. And um, so uh, thanks for the, the, the kind introduction, Marius. Um, I will, uh, I think I'll just jump straight into my presentation. And if you don't mind, I'll just kill my video while I'm doing the, the screen share. 
play presentation now. Is that okay, Marius? Yeah, we have you. Uh, we have the, the presentation right now. Perfect. Looks good. Okay. So, um, without further ado, I will. So I'll give a very brief overview of robotic technologies and what we do, um, very, very brief, um, and focus mainly then on uh, how we apply AI in some of the projects that we are working on, and picking two, focusing on two in particular. One is the space use case, um, and one is the warehousing use case. Uh, these are two different partners that we're working with um, to implement AI uh, in edge applications for real just to summarize at the end. So a bit about Eubotica. So we develop computer vision and AI solutions um, on a consultancy basis. And then we have our own R&D stream as well. Uh, we focus mainly on uh, embedded applications, or what we call uh, edge-based. I can go into a bit more detail in a few slides on what that means. But essentially, think about edge-based as being uh, as where the, the processing, or in this case, the AI, uh, is performed. Uh, at the network edge, or if you like, in the same uh, location as the data is gathered. So a simple example that you can think of is that the AI processing is performed on the camera, essentially, at the point of where the, the images are acquired. And there's, there's many reasons why this is very, very beneficial, and I'll cover these in the next few slides. Uh, we have a team of uh, 10 full-time, plus a couple of uh, interns working with us, and that's split between our office in DCU Alpha in Glasnevin, right beside TAG. Uh, and we have a, a design center outside Madrid in Spain as well. Um, and then finally, the, the areas that we, we, we focus on, um, so we, we use the Myriad 2 chip, which I will talk about on the next slide, for many of our applications. But the areas that we focus on are space, uh, automation, or factory 4.0, uh, and biomedical as well. Uh, in the biomedical space, we, we, we've done some work uh, on retinal, retinal image analysis. Um, which, uh, well, it was very interesting, and uh, I think it has some very interesting uh, future potential, but I won't actually cover that in this presentation, more, more for lack of time than, than anything else. Okay, so um, just to finish up then on, on a bit on Eubotica. So we are heavily focused on using um, the Myriad chipset from um, Intel Mavidius. So this is a, a, a chip you can see in the right of the picture there. So it's less than one square centimeter in size. Um, that's a VPU or a vision processing unit. So you can think of it without getting too technical as a, a very low power um, but very efficient processor for um, performing both computer vision applications uh, and artificial intelligence applications. So the, the way the processor is designed, it's very good for, for vector operations, uh, which are particularly useful for computer vision, for processing images essentially. I'll move on. So use case number one, which is the application of AI in space. Um, so why, why do we want to do this? So there's a class of uh, satellites that uh, most of the national space agencies have, um, which is uh, Earth, observation, Earth, Earth observation satellites, where essentially they've got cameras or sensors of different types um, that fly on satellites and, and point towards the, the Earth's surface. and capture images and data um, about the Earth's surface. Because this is a, probably the largest, uh, or the bulk of the satellites other than telecoms are used for this purpose. Um, and the European Space Agency in particular is a leader in these Earth observation satellites. Um, the problem with, or not the problem, but one of the issues with these satellites is that they generate huge amounts of data. So the existing, um, if you like, state of the art, European Space Agency satellites are Sentinel, are the Sentinel-2 uh, class satellites. Um, but they are currently planning their next uh, phase of satellites. So they could be the next generation after the Sentinel uh, satellites. And, and the, this next generation, which are currently in uh, well beyond planning, but at the production stage, uh, these satellites, when they're launched in about, I think it's about six years time, these satellites will generate 10 times more data from their sensors than they can possibly actually download to Earth. So the problem here is that as technology and sensor resolution advances, they're able to uh, capture a, a, an expanding amount of information on the satellite, but actually it's very difficult to get that information back to ground because there's so much of it. Um, and the downlink is limited bandwidth and too expensive. So AI can provide um, a solution to this uh, problem. 
so in, in this case, edge processing is where you're processing the data directly on the satellite. So rather than capture the image data on the satellite and down link it to a ground station on Earth, transfer it to a processing center or else on Earth and actually do the image processing at that point, uh, you're looking to push some of that processing directly onto the satellite. So why do you want to do this? Well, there is a significant uh, bandwidth and cost saving by analyzing the data on the satellite because we throw away data on the, on the satellite, we analyze each image, if you like, and, and throw away the images that are not useful, uh, that, that don't contain useful information. And therefore, we only transmit the data that is useful, uh, which, which allows us to utilize the downlink bandwidth. In other words, the, the, uh, the data that we transmit back to Earth from the satellite is of much higher value because it doesn't contain images that are susceptible of, of no use for whatever purpose. Aubrey, sorry to cut in here. Um, we're having a slight problem with the with the sound. It drops out a little bit, so your voice gets very very low in volume. Okay. Um, I know I know you're speaking fast to get through all your points, <laughs> but uh, but maybe if you spoke a little a little bit slower and a little bit louder, then it would be uh, would ease some of the problem. Is that is that any better? Yeah, I, th I think it might be the uh, the internet connection actually that, that that's what's dropping up because it's intermittent. It goes goes up and down. But uh, but I don't think we have any any other solutions. It's just uh, speaking a bit slower and a bit louder, then then will be be good. Absolutely sure. Okay. okay. Thanks. No problem. No problem. Um, okay. So that so one benefit is that we don't downlink as much data, and therefore we can use the available downlink bandwidth uh, more effectively. Uh, and a second benefit is that we can respond faster uh, to events that we see in images. So for example, if we are trying to if we are searching for uh, virus, virus to virus in our image data, uh, we can actually analyze the image on the satellite, determine if there is a fire and where it is, and, trans and transmit that information, as in the fire is located at you know, position X, Y, or um, latitude, longitude, X, Y, uh, rather than transmit all the image data. In and out. Subsequently on the ground, try to um, analyze that data to, to discover where the, the fires may be. Okay, um, how does AI actually fit into this? Well, AI is particularly good uh, when it's applied to image data. Um, in many ways, AI tries to view image data in the same way that humans view image data. Um, and you know, humans are, because of our, our design, are very good at uh, capturing uh, and, and understanding visual data, even more so than, than most other forms of data that, we, uh, that we're exposed to. Um, so typically, the, the AI apply, as applied to image data is in the form of uh, computational neural networks, so CNNs. Um, but in the, in the case of space, by applying AI to the images that we're capturing on the satellite, uh, we are able to um, perform different applications with the same uh, infrastructure, physical hardware. So a simple example of this is if we have one application where we want to monitor amount of plankton in the oceans and another another application where we want to search for fires. What we can do by, by using um, an AI solution on the satellite, we, we can determine when we're over ocean or sea, and then we can load our uh, plankton detection network, or plank plankton AI solution. And then when we're over land, we can just swap out the solutions without changing any of the hardware just in, in software, swap out the solutions and, and load our fire detection uh, application. So by Using AI directly uh, on the satellite, we can actually perform different tasks and es essentially time slice our, um, our applications. Uh, another example of how AI is particularly beneficial for satellite imagery is that it can, it, it can work autonom autonomously or semi-autonomously. Uh, so there's a, um, a body in the United States called the NGA, the National Geo-Intelligence Agency. Uh, and these are effectively the, the, the U.S. spy satellite analysts, if you like. And they have uh, estimated that in order to process the amount of data that they acquire from satellites, satellite imagery, they would need to employ 60 million people uh, on an ongoing basis just to process the amount of data that they, that they have access to. So data volume is a huge issue uh, in space imagery, and AI is a way to potentially solve this by automating some of these processes. Incre incredible numbers, sir, for jumping back in again, Aubrey. Incredible numbers, and, and what are you, what a use case for AI. I was wondering, uh, could it be that your microphone might be acting up a little bit? Uh, is it moving while you're speaking? Is there a chance? Uh, because it, it, it sounds like the microphone is moving back and forth uh, from your mouth, like the volume turns up and then down. 
Um, but if it's not, then then I think it's just a, an internet broadband uh, speed thing, um, and then there's nothing we can do about it. I was just I was just wondering. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I could probably use the uh, laptop laptop microphone if you can tell it. Can we te can we test it for a second just to try it? Can you still hear me? Yes, you're loud and clear. Is it better? It's louder. And it's, okay. it's, not, it's not dropping out, but we haven't tried for long. So let's try this way for a second. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Okay. So um, I'm going to briefly go through a couple of interesting uh, AI applications for space imagery or for Earth observation imagery from satellites. The first one is uh, ship identification. Uh, so this addresses uh, both piracy and smuggling um, problems effectively. So uh, each, each boat or large boat should have a transponder, a bit like the way aircraft have transponders, which indicates uh, where they are and who they are, and their, their size, etc. cetera. Um, and for, in the cases of piracy and smuggling, a lot of uh, times these transponder, transponders are either turned off or are, um, are spoofed so that they, they say they are someone else effectively. So by correlating the transponder data with uh, data, visual data on where the boats or ships are located based on satellite imagery, um, this spoofing can be uh, detected because you can check the size of the boat and see does it correlate with the, the size that the transponder is, um, is saying that it is. Uh, so uh, as we know in the, in, in, in the, in the, uh, is the Gulf of Aden, there's a lot of uh, piracy at the moment. So um, this is, potentially a quite uh, valuable or useful application uh, in, in today's climate. And another application is for hyperspectral imaging. Uh, a lot of satellites, uh, and, and more and more so as, as time goes on, are uh, carrying hyperspectral sensors on board. So these are sensors that acquire data at multiple different um, wavelengths. So typically uh, 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 the images that we're used to um, acquiring our RGB images, so red, green, and blue channels. But hyperspectral images might capture 40, 50, even 100 different channels, and each one is at a different wavelength. And uh, the immediate problem here is there is a very, very large data volume acquired. Uh, and again, this is very expensive uh, and slow to transmit or downlink back to Earth. So if you can process some of this data on the satellite, uh, you don't have to transmit all of, all of the uh, uh, hyperspectral data, you only transmit the results of your, your algorithm, which more often than not is an AI algorithm. Uh, uh, the example here is uh, fire detection. So we can see this is a um, wildfire um, example in, I think, in South, Car South Carolina. Um, and by looking at this, the spectral signature um, of the, uh, the fire, both the, the burnt area and the actual active fire itself, and these uh, areas can be detected directly uh, in the satellite imagery and the hyperspectral imagery. And once the areas are detected and flagged, you transmit only the locations of these fires and the, the burnt area back down to Earth, but not the actual hyperspectral data. So again, you, you save bandwidth and you end up being able to detect the fires um, much, much more quickly. Uh, one other example is uh, in data analytics. Now, this is a fairly famous example. Some of you might have heard of this before, where a company analyzed the um, occupancy of car parks for uh, JC Penney's shops across the US. So you can see in this image here, this is uh, one of their shops and each of the light blue dots um, is been, has been identified by an AI algorithm uh, as a car. So they counted the number of cars in the car parks over a long period of time and, and managed to show how this correlates very closely with the stock price of JC Penney's. Because obviously the less busy the car parks are, um, the less business that the shop is doing. So you can see the, the, the black line is the car count and the green line is, is the stock price. So by using uh, AI on the edge, on the satellites, uh, for, on satellite information, satellite imagery, uh, you can do some interesting um, tasks uh, which help with prediction, basically, prediction of um, stock prices. Or there's another interesting one around prediction of oil prices based on and the location of oil tankers as they travel from the, from the Gulf up towards Europe. Uh, okay, so getting on to one where we're involved with, this is uh, cloud detection. So at any time of the day um, during daylight hours, because most of the satellite imagery that's captured is in the visible spectrum, uh, when, there's a, when there are clouds, the Earth's surface under the clouds is not captured by the, the satellites. So cloud detection is a cloud detection room and um, 
what, what you do is you detect the clouds and don't transmit the data um, uh, that, that is cloudy. So you look at the first row of this uh, image here, you see uh, this is a visual, visible spectrum uh, image of the Earth's surface. Um, in the second row, uh, an algorithm has been applied to try to detect clouds. This may be based on hyperspectral imagery or maybe more of a CNN model. Um, and once you've detected these spots that are clouds, you remove them, or in this case, you set them to fixed color, uh, red, which you can see in the bottom row. And then when we transmit this data, the bottom row of data, the, the red blocks here are, um, are compressed to a very, well, they're effectively not transmitted at all. You, you can compress them very highly. So by going from the top row to the bottom row, you're only transmitting useful data uh, and you're, not, you're never transmitting the, the cloudy data. Uh, so in a country like Ireland, we tend to have a lot of cloud cover. And so if we were to just always transmit the actual visual data, there would be a lot of wasted imagery transmitted, which costs money and takes time. Um, and when the imagery is received from the ground and someone analyzes it, they will just throw it away straight away because it's, it's no use, it's just cloudy. So this comes to, I guess, where we have an involvement. So um, we are working on a cloud detection uh, algorithm, AI algorithm, that uh, is going to fly on a mission later this year. Um, but just to give some background, we are using the Myriad 2 chip that I mentioned at the beginning of the, the talk. Uh, and to try to give some context on why the Myriad 2 chip is actually of uh, a lot of use in, the, in these kind of space applications. We can look at a mission that is launching by European Space Agency in 2020. This is a lunar lander that they are um, preparing currently. And they have a, a system that uses computer vision to try to land the, the module on the lunar surface um, at the desired location. In order, to, in order to do that, they have um, uh, essentially, if you like, a a powerful desktop PC that they are flying. So you can see the specs there in front of you. It's, it works at about four frames a second. The whole system weighs 35 kilograms. It uses a 800 mega, uh, a PC operating at 800 megahertz with a couple of FPGA accelerators as well. So it's quite a bulky system. And that is, is not too, too dissimilar to what you would design if you were to just uh, do this on Earth. But what, what the Myriad 2 chip um, and similar chips allow is to perform a lot of the same functionality uh, at much, much lower power with much more high, high performance uh, and, and much lower weight. Um, and the, the, the primary reason why um, you can achieve these benefits uh, in space, or not the primary reason, but one of the, the interesting facts is that typically for space applications, there is maybe a five to 10 year design cycle uh, or design time. Uh, that's how long it can take to design hardware that's specifically, specifically meant for space applications. And what we're seeing here, I guess, between the left of the slide and the right of the slide is this shift that's happening in the space industry where they are starting to look at commercial um, electronics, or in this case, um, commercial silicon products, um, as an alternative to specifically designing something for space. And by using off-the-shelf commercial products, the design cycle and, uh, uh, becomes much, much shorter, you know, potentially as, as short as months. Um, so they get access to much more recent technology, and that's why we see such a jump between um, the traditional space design approach and the more, more recent um, capture use of commercial off-the-shelf technology. Um, so I won't bore you with all the numbers, but if you look at the space, um, the, the number of frames per second that, the, that can be uh, processed by these two solutions on, on the slide in front of you, how fast they can be done, the weight of the solution, the power um, required for the solutions, and the cost of the solutions. You come up with a number which is almost one by 10 to the 15 times more effective to use the, um, the, the, if you like, the right-hand solution is page or the modern off-the-shelf technology versus the more traditional space designed technology. So there's a, a huge potential saving in terms of um, cost uh, and efficiency. Um, and, and a chip like the Muria 2 chip, which we're using, uh, can, can give you these kinds of performance improvements. So the application that we are involved in is, as I said, it's a, a cloud detection application and it's flying on something called a CubeSat. Uh, so this is a, a small satellite that is made up of blocks that are 100 millimeters uh, on the side. So these small cubes are 100 millimeters cubed. And they are relatively inexpensive compared to their, their typical large satellites that, that do Earth observation. The PCB that we're using, the, the, the circuit board we're using for um, the cloud detection application is what's shown in the top picture here. So it costs about 300 euro. Um, and you can get an idea of the size in, in that picture there. Of course, because it's a, it's a much smaller um, satellite, the downlink capability or the amount of data that 
can be downloaded to Earth is quite small, so it's about 70 megabytes per day, um, which means that if you're capturing hyperspectral data, which this uh, satellite will be, there's no way you can downlink it at all. It's just not feasible. So by doing something like, uh, by applying an AI in, a, in an example such as uh, cloud detection, you can reduce the amount of data to be downlinked and therefore incre increase the richness of this data. And it also means we can potentially extend the mission life, both because we can uh, change the AI uh, algorithm to, to perform a secondary task, um, and also we can, we can save in power because we're only downlinking, downlinking can, tends to be quite, or transmitting data tends to be quite an, a, a power um, drain on the, uh, on the satellite. So we can extend the mission life by, by reducing the power required. Uh, so you can see the picture on the bottom left is the hyperspectral sensor, if you like the camera. That's launching on the, the Vega satellite, which is shown in the middle there, sorry, Vega rocket, uh, from French Guiana in sometime in August of this year. Uh, so we'll be launching our board on top of that um, hyperspectral imager. Uh, and actually, yep, yeah, this is a picture of it here. So the, the hardware on the right there is um, the, it's called the Hyperscout 2, developed by a company in uh, the Netherlands. And our board for AI is sitting on the very top of that um, imager. Uh, so the imager captures about 40 spectral bands and three thermal infrared bands. So a lot of data compared to your, your standard three channel um, camera. And with that data, we are process, processing it on the AI board in order to perform cloud detection. These are some examples of uh, actual examples that we've used to train the algorithm. So the left image is pretty obviously cloudy and the middle image is you know, relatively cloud free. Um, but the tricky ones are ones like the right-hand image, which is actually uh, snow on, on a mountain range, but it can be difficult in many, uh, in many circumstances to, to differentiate between that and, and cloud. Um, the overall time then in our application, which we've finished and already submitted to the satellite integrator, takes about 150 milliseconds uh, per uh, inference. So per image, it takes about 150 milliseconds for the AI, AI algorithm to determine if it's cloudy or not. Okay, I'm taking a little sideways step here, but trying to emphasize again how um, some of the, this modern technology, chips like the Myriad 2 and other AI um, chips, or chips that enable AI, are somewhat rev revolutionizing the, the space industry. And so in, in order to use these chips and this new technology in space, because it's not designed for space, you have to go through um, a series of uh, characterization steps to make sure that it's, it will operate suitably in space. And one of the biggest questions or issues here is uh, around the radiation effect. So in space, there are uh, particles and ions that will impact on the silicon directly on the chip itself and may cause it to, to function incorrectly. So before it flies, you have to test the um, extent to which this radiation may affect the operation of the chip. So back at last November, um, as part of our contract with the European Space Agency, we took the Myriad 2 chip and went to um, CERN in, on the Swiss-French border. And we used uh, the, something called the super proton synchrotron, which is the injector to the Large Hadron Collider. So these are very, very large particle accelerators. Uh, you can see in the picture in the top right, a very large circle. I think it's a 27 kilometer circumference. That's the Large Hadron Collider. And the smaller circle is the, is the um, accelerator that we used, which is the, the SPS. I think it's about six kilometer in um, circumference. So we spent uh, 36 hours testing the chip, bombarding it with ions and measuring the results to see how it performed uh, under this uh, radiate under under radiation and, and and therefore allowed us to predict how it would perform in space so overall those was, uh, those tests went very well and um, but of course they don't come out come without uh, an associated cost so running these tests was you know relatively expensive but nothing compared to the cost of um, the the larger satellite missions so uh, the sentinel the sentinel 2 missions themselves i think they were 350 million per satellite so what I'm showing on this slide, I guess, is that by, even though it's difficult and can be difficult to uh, characterize some of the modern electronics to be able to fly in space, rather it's still a much, much cheaper solution than actually designing the uh, electronics from the ground up for space applications. And that's why we're able to use the Myriad 2. Uh, because we've gone through this characterization process, we're able to fly the Myriad 2 um, on missions. Okay, um, I breezed through that fairly quickly, but I guess the main summary points here are that uh, because of the new, uh, new electronics that are available for doing AI inference, um, and because of the space agency's uh, acceptance that this is actually the only way, by using this technology, it's the only way they can really keep up to, to date with the, the possibilities around AI. 
Um, this is only in its infancy, really. It's only started to happen. So the, the application of AI in space is, is a very uh, cutting edge um, uh, solution or application. Um, AI is particularly good for data-driven problems and in, for, for Earth observation from space satellites, there is a lot of data because the sensors acquire continuously acquire data and images of the Earth's surface. And again, if it's hyperspectral, you know, you've got 40 times um, data volume to process. And AI is, is very good at this type of problem where you can train it on a lot of data and then let it run autonomously on its own. Of course, training is uh, a big part of the, the equation in terms of using AI. Um, you can go very wrong if you don't use the right training data. And one of the difficulties with the application of AI in space is that often you don't have the data available to you before you launch the satellite because you don't have an equivalent satellite up in space. So for a, a new sensor, you have to try to um, synthesize data for training uh, before you launch and only when you launch and actually um, have spent your, you know, 2 million up to 350 million to, to launch, to build and launch a satellite, only then can you actually test with your final sensor how well your AI, AI algorithm is working. So there's a lot of effort that goes into selecting appropriate training data for these missions. But overall, the benefits of AI, um, it's, it allows you to have a faster response, for example, in the cases of fire detection. Um, it means that you only transmit or downlink higher value data, so you have a much better use of your downlink bandwidth. You lower the power consumption because to transmit data is much more power um, expensive or has a much higher power draw than to actually process the data on the satellite itself. You can um, make the missions have longer lifetimes because you can repurpose. You can just uplink a new AI um, algorithm, a new set of weights for your network, and you can perform multiple different functions with the same hardware and the same satellite. Um, and then temporal mission retasking is where you can actually have maybe two or three or four different um, networks or AI solutions. And you can, in software, you can just change them in and change them out as desired while the, the satellite is orbiting different parts of the Earth. Okay, um, I have about a little under 10 minutes left, so I'll go through this one a little bit quicker. So this is the second use case that we're involved in. Um, and it's to do with warehouse management, so the management of, where, of freight as it uh, enters and leaves uh, large warehouses. This is a project that we're doing um, in collaboration with Lenovo. Um, so they have a very large uh, warehouse in North Carolina in the States, uh, they, where they import a lot of product into. Uh, and stored, uh, I think it has 500 aisles or something like that in the, in the warehouse. So it's a very large warehouse. And they, they, had a, they have a problem where, or they identified a, a, a deficiency, I guess, in their system, uh, which is explained in this diagram here. So at the bottom right is where they receive goods from uh, their containers, or the, the trucks that deliver to their warehouse. Um, and what they typically do is once they receive that data, they use forklifts to transfer it into the uh, the next available uh, space in their warehouse, which is the bottom left block. But they haven't, they haven't inventorized it or they haven't, uh, in fact, in this case, they haven't purchased it because it's, they're just storing it so it's still owned by the vendor. And then at some point later on, it has to be removed from that vendor area, brought back into the staging area, again, by forklift. It has to be, they have to figure out what it is. It has to be labeled. And at that stage, it's effectively purchased. And then it's moved by forklift again into the purple area up the top left is which is where the Lenovo owned area. So there's a bit of shuttling around of products. So when it arrives, it doesn't go straight to the purple, it goes to the red first. And they really, they identified this as a, as a shortcoming in the process. So they wanted to move more to a process like this where the data arrives into the staging area already labeled in some way um, and identifiable in some way. Uh, so that when it's picked up by the forklift in the staging area, it can be directly moved to the Lenovo owned area um, and the, the, pur the purchase can happen at that stage. They skip two uh, steps in the inventory put away. So I hope that the bandwidth is sufficient to show this video. Marius, you can let me know if it's too jumpy. Uh, but anyway, I, I will talk over it as well. So this is actually one of their um, uh, promotional videos for this solution that we're working with them on. Uh, this was launched at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona in February of, of this year. So you can see this is the, the staging area where the forklift is removing product from back of a 40 foot truck uh, and moving it into the staging area. So we have these cameras um, at ceiling height mounted on the ceiling. And actually, if I just stop that for one second. Uh, so we have these 
DM codes, what are called data matrix codes that are attached both to the forklift, fixed to the forklift and attached to each piece of freight as it comes in. Uh, the cameras identify these DMs, uh, decode them, and then they know which forklift and which um, product they uh, contain. And then this uh, data is sent to a, a central management system in the warehouse, which determines where the forklift should be delivered to. So what we see here in the screen at the moment is what the driver of the forklift will see. It basically tells him that you have the pallets listed up in the top right, and you need to move them to the lane listed in the top left, GBK20. So feedback is provided automatically directly to the forklift driver. So then he go, he needs, he knows to go to row uh, J or aisle uh, GBK20. So off he goes on his journey to GBK20. Now the forklifts also have this upward facing camera, which is monitoring where the driver is within the warehouse, warehouse itself and which lane he is entering. So you can see when he enters the lane, it tells him that he's reached the correct lane and to unload. So he goes down the lane, unloads, and then we've got another camera which detects the unload event itself. So it detects when the forklift has become unloaded, and it detects the lane ID by the upward facing camera, and it sends all that information back to the warehouse management system. So the end result is that the system is updated uh, in real time. You save two uh, transitions or two forklift journeys per product, per pallet. Um, and this is all enabled by using the uh, ceiling mounted uh, vision system, uh, but also enabled by using uh, the application of AI. So I'll show you where the AI is used in a minute. Um, but you might ask, well, why are they doing this with vision instead of RFID, which we get asked a lot. And uh, so RFID is it's much more it's a much less flexible and much more expensive solution. So the, in this case, the labels that go on the freight are simply printed uh, A4 sheets or stickers, and um, you can print them in any any black and white printer. So they're very easy and, and and cheap to produce. And all the intelligence is basically in the in the well, at the edge or on the the compute side. So we take the vision vision data and we process it on a server, and the server is fitted with several of these various. Um, compute sticks, which you see in the right, the picture in the right here. Um, and these are essentially, again, they use the Myriad 2 device to perform, um, effectively perform AI and the video data. Um, I don't think I need to go to too much detail on this slide, but basically this says where we've got, we're processing visual data on the left, um, we receive queries and we send events back. So these events back would be typically what forklifts are in view and what pallets are in view. And this information is communicated back, communicated back to the warehouse management system. Uh, it determines which lane the forklift needs to go to, and then it sends that back to the, the forklift driver. He goes to that lane, drops off his load, and then again, that is automatically detected and routed back to the warehouse management system. And this is then ultimately uh, interfaced in real time with the SAP system. So you end up with a very accurate digital twin. Your, your, your digital stock taking is very, uh, very accurately replicates what's actually in your warehouse. And this is just showing how the cameras are used. So you have a camera typically on each side of the forklift or multiple cameras on each side of the forklift. And as the, as the forklift drives through this kind of virtual gate or virtual visual gate, um, the, the barcodes or the, the data matrices are detected and decoded. So you might ask, well, where does AI come into this? So this is um, a example frame from a, a real application in, in the warehouse in North Carolina. Uh, and in order to detect these uh, four data matrices that we see, these black and white barcodes, um, without using AI or in, in a computer vision uh, methodology, it takes about 28 seconds for this particular frame because it processes it, if you like, pixel by pixel. It doesn't have, uh, shall we say, the intelligence that uh, the AI solution has. But when we apply an AI solution, uh, we, can de we can detect them uh, within uh, less than 50 milliseconds. So we get a, a huge um, increase in, in the number of frames we can process, but ultimately it makes the solution feasible. I mean, at the, at the 28 seconds per frame, it's, it's just not a feasible solution. It wouldn't work. Um, of course, again, training data is, is key as it is to all AI, AI algorithms. So and just to give you some numbers around this, and I'm almost finished then, um, we labeled about three and a half thousand images manually. So this took us about eight days where you're literally drawing boxes around the data matrices in the image to help to, to train the network. Then for each of these images, we augmented them by adding noise to some, uh, rotating them, changing their size and changing their orientation or mirroring the images. So we went from having 3,500 labeled images to approximately, well, just under half a million total images. So we can synthetically essentially generate new images for training. And so with these half million images, then we train them uh, using a 
fairly standard Intel uh, Xeon uh, with two NVIDIA GTX graphics uh, GPUs. And the total training time was about three weeks. So that's kind of the, the training effort involved in the, in the solution. So my second last slide is just to show you the solution in operation. So the, the two video frames you see are from the, this virtual gate, the left and right of the same forklift. And they're slightly out of sync by about a second. That's just the, the video that I made for this um, presentation. Obviously, in reality, they're in sync. The top left uh, shows the decoding. So all of the data matrices, as they're decoded, are um, they're, sorry, they're decoded in real time, detected, decoded in real time, and then sent to the server. And in the bottom right, we see the messages that are flying around the, um, the network. These are, it uses a lightweight messaging protocol to notify the warehouse management system of what forklift uh, is where and what load it has and whether it's unloaded or not, what lane it's at, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you can see this is running at about 12 and a half frames a second. So again, if we weren't able to use AI for this solution, it would just be completely infeasible because the forklift would be gone long gone from view uh, before even one frame has been processed and the driver wouldn't know where he's supposed to go and the, the, man, the warehouse management system wouldn't know what's where essentially. Okay, uh, so to summarize that one, um, uh, why is AI used here? Well, it, it, first of all, it enables the system to, to, to function where previously it would not have uh, been possible with the, without AI. From a, from a Nova's point of view, there's fewer forklift journeys, there's, there's less human input, which means less errors, and their digital inventory much more closely matches the actual inventory. In other words, their stock taking is, is much more accurate. And um, because we're using, I think at the moment, we might have eight cameras in the staging area, and they generate a lot of data, they're continuously on, continuously sending data. So in order to process this, this data, the um, computer vision along with uh, AI, an AI solution makes it feasible to process this, the amount of data that's coming through. And rather than transmitting the data through the entire system, rather than transmitting the image data through the entire system, only as soon as the um, data matrices and the barcodes are decoded, only the decoded information is, is sent on. So that you're massively reducing the amount of data that's moving around your system. Of course, training is key, as we said before. Uh, for sure, not one size fits all for training. So each, each network is trained differently, but even for the same network, for two different, literally for two different locations in the warehouse, because of lighting conditions or because of um, the orientation of the camera, we may actually uh, train using different sets of data. And ultimately, you want to train with the data that most closely replicates what you will see in reality with your system. So generic is not always the best solution. Um, as I said, then the benefits of AI is that we have a frame rate that makes the system feasible um, and that we can accommodate uh, environmental variations easily by retraining. So, for example, we had some, uh, one situation where the image data, the camera was a very dark environment and the camera was quite noisy in the front of the forklift. We actually trained on the noisy data and we end up getting very good results from our network. Okay, so last page. Uh, in summary, AI is, uh, I think we all know at this stage, it's, um, it's expanding rapidly and it's becoming a, a, a buzzword or has become a buzzword for sure. But for, in some cases, space being one of them, um, it really is only just happening now that it's possible to apply AI in space. And to, one, our contact, Anissa, has actually been quoted or quote, gave us this quote to say that for him, it's, it's actually a paradigm shift. So it completely changes the way that, that ESA expect to think about applications in space in the future, particularly for onboard satellites. Uh, AI is particularly good at operating on visual data or, or data from cameras and image sensors uh, because it can reduce down the amount of data in a, in a feasible amount of time. Uh, and therefore, from that point onwards, only um, information, if you like, is sent on rather than image data. So we think of it sometimes as for the AI algorithm, it takes pixels in and it sends metadata out. So it does the, it does the identification or the the, the clever is on the data, on the image data, and just sends out the results rather than passing on the data, image data itself. Uh, I think I've highlighted both times that, that training is, is key. Uh, you hear this a lot with AI, but it, it's just very true. Um, in fact, a lot of the time, the networks themselves are, are fairly standard because they've had a lot of research into, into them uh, to, de to design um, effective network architectures, but where the variation is, is, is actually in the training data itself. So it's selecting appropriate training data. And then finally, one of, the, one of the big benefits of AI is really that it allows a level of automation or semi-automation, uh, which essentially frees up uh, human operators to do other tasks. And, and the example here, again, would be the data analysts. Um, if you can 
uh, take what a data analyst does and implement it instead you, with an AI algorithm, which is often very feasible to do, then you free up the time of that analyst to do more important and, and more difficult maybe tasks that AI is less suited to do. And that is uh, it. So I hope you uh, enjoy that. I hope I didn't go through it too fast. Um, I see in five minutes over, hopefully Marius won't mind. Um, so if there's any questions, yeah, I'm happy to take those. No, not at all. Thank you very much, Aubrey. That was a really, really good presentation. Right on the point and extremely interesting content. It's, it's, it's so cool to see how you actually apply this stuff in, in the real world. Um, we, we do have a couple of questions. Um, uh, most of them revolve around uh, the, the space applications and then a couple came in uh, around the, the warehouse uh, application as well. But the, the first question, Aaron Doran asks, what would be the typical cost for a full rig of hardware as used in these use cases? And he's talking about space. So what is the, the typical cost for full rig of hardware? Uh, so it very much depends. Um, I mean, from the, uh, starting at the bottom, the, the chip, something like the Myriad 2 chip uh, itself is probably only, um, well, it's, it's less than $40 anyway, for sure. Um, and and this, would, uh, this would replace older technologies that would be you know, far, far more expensive in the, in the tens or hundreds of thousands. Um, if you if you take a piece of uh, a, a, a silicon chip, you know an, an IC that is designed from the bottom up for use in space, they can cost up to a hundred thousand per chip. It's not that's not the design cost; that's the actual cost you buy each chip. So by comparing hundred thousand to forty, you see how there's a, a huge saving there in terms of uh, using the, the more commercial uh, products that are available off the shelf. And um, then as you as you go up the chain in terms of image sensors, yes, a lot of these are just the hyperspectral sensors are typically custom designed for space, so they can be quite expensive offhand. Uh, I don't have an idea of cost. And um, the cube sats themselves, they, well, the, the the figure that's typically quoted is I think somewhere between ten and twenty thousand dollars per kilogram to launch into space. Now that that price is coming down with the likes of SpaceX, but um, it's it's you know we say ten thousand euro per per kilo, so. Clearly, any, any weight saving is hugely important as well because it equates to uh, money saving. Um, the very large Earth observation satellites, such as the Sentinels, you know, there, there would not be many, there would not be very many um, companies or bodies who would launch these types of satellites. And as I say, they're in the, in the hundreds of millions to, uh, to launch. The CubeSats, I don't have a good figure offhand, but um, they are certainly, you know, several hundred thousand to launch, but actually that's considered relatively cheap. Sorry, not to launch in, in, in total. But well, that's considered relatively cheap compared to the kind of uh, more traditional larger satellites. Okay, we have a follow-up question from uh, Eric Pakin. Uh, since it is so much cheaper, do you plan for redundancy systems and ship more chips when including in a satellite? <laughs> Good question. So, um, yes, redundancy is hugely important in space. Um, if you design the chip from the ground up, you design in. Um, um, radiation mitigation uh, into your hardware. So in other words, your, your chip is designed to be tolerant to radiation. But as I said, we're, there, a lot of the agencies are moving towards the commercial products. And in this case, you have two choices. You can either, or even, you can combine them as well, but they are to perform or to implement what's called software mitigation, where you, you write your software in the knowledge that you are likely to have you know, upsets due to radiation. And so for, for example, in a really simple case, you might rewrite a configuration register every second so that it doesn't, it doesn't get uh, changed by radiation. Um, so that's uh, one aspect. And the second aspect is, as, as your, your questioner asked there, it's around um, redundancy. So you might have triple redundancy is a typical one that you can say where they have, let's say, for example, three myriad two chips. They ask the same question and they provide the same input data to each chip. And only if the two of those two of those answers, or at least two of those answers, agree, do they consider that to be the correct um, or a reliable answer. So it's a yeah, a tri triple or, triple mo modular redundancy is something that's typically used uh, in space. So yes, there is likely that you would have used more of the commercial chips to ensure that you get this uh, voting, get this agreement. Um, but the numbers are still you know one versus three. It's it's not like it's a huge difference. Okay, um, a, a question from uh, Kevin Neary. Is data quality an issue to achieve good AI in space applications? Uh, I suppose that depends exactly. So um, most, most AI algorithms uh, will actually, or certainly most CNNs, convolutional neural networks, will, will downsample their data a lot before actually applying the, the algorithm, the AI algorithm. So 
typically very, very um, uh, fine detail is actually not really, is often not considered by the AI algorithms because they're more asking questions like, uh, you know, is this a fire in the image uh, as opposed to is this specific one pixel in the image, you know, um, is it flamers and that kind of thing. So maybe that wasn't the best example, but uh, data quality is, is always important. But for a lot of the applications of AI, it's really about recognizing um, objects or, or properties. And, and typically these, these are much uh, lower frequency data in images. Um, I mean, a lot of the, the Earth observation satellites, they may, they may only have a resolution of you know, 75 meters, 100 meters, 300 meters per pixel. So the, the, the resolution on the ground is already, uh, a relative to the ground is already quite low uh, for a lot of these images. But then they are imaging you know, vast areas uh, in one go space. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and another question concerning the data for space imagery. Eric Pakin asks, is the training data used for space imagery publicly available or was it acquired privately? Uh, good question. So um, there, are, there are both basically. So most of the, tra of the, sorry, of the Earth observation data that, for example, ESA um, acquire is actually publicly available to um, well, EU citizens anyway. Publicly available for research or publicly available for any purpose in the EU. Um, so there's vast amounts of data from the satellites that is freely available. Um, obviously, when you start looking at data that is from specific sensors, um, which is, for example, the, the project we're working on, the CubeSat project we're working on, and uh, that is, is proprietary to the, um, the sensor owner or the satellite owner. So you know, we have access to this because we're a partner on the project and, and, and everyone ultimately is, is funded by ESA for this particular project. So data is shared amongst the partners in the project. Um, so yeah, it, it splits, it depends. There, there are commercial sat, um, Earth observation companies, um, DMOS Space, and other, there are several other ones, and they will obviously sell their data. You know, that their, their business model is to acquire data and then sell it. And, and in fact, that chain of, the chain between acquiring the data on the satellite and selling the data, it can have multiple steps and multiple different partners. So some people will are just involved in maintaining the satellites and some people are involved in downlinking the data. Some people or companies are involved in analyzing that data. You know, there's a lot of um, post-processing of data that is often required where we have to you know, register channels together, where we have to reference each image to a, a, a geolocation. Um, and at, at each different stage, their data might be sold um, at a different price effectively, depending on how, how well uh, conditioned the data is. So, the, the public bodies, I guess, to answer your question, tend to make most of their data freely available. Um, but the, the, obviously the, the private companies, the companies who sell the data, obviously they don't, they don't make it free, they, they make their money off of selling that data. But there's certainly a, a large, very large amount of data available um, through ESA. I think it's the Copernicus program. If you want to look it up, you can, you can get free access to it. Mm -hmm. um, a question from Aaron Dorn. He says, the benefits are so strong for using AI on satellites. How long do you estimate before it will be before this becomes standard practice? Uh, good question. Um, I mean, I guess you have to understand that it's only really becoming possible because of the advances at the, at the microelectronics level, um, which are, I guess, are being pushed ultimately by, by commercial terrestrial um, business business opportunities. Um, so it, it is only a very recent. It's only recently become possible. Um, as far as we're aware, the the launch that we're involved in when we launch our circuit board on the, the CubeSat in August, it will be the first European, first example of uh, European uh, CubeSat that has AI on board. So it's, it, it is quite cutting edge. So a lot of the, I guess space is quite, they tend to be quite conservative in space. Everything is typically so expensive. Emissions are, are so expensive. So they, they tend to want a lot of data before they will commit to using a new technology in space. So the, the funding that we're actually funded under from ESA what's called um, IOD, so in-orbit demonstrator. So, uh, and many other companies would be at a similar level where it's really about getting, um, uh, proving AI as a solution in space. Um, and, and ESA are, are very willing to fund these um, proof of concepts so that they can gather data to ultimately uh, convince the, I guess, the larger operators that this is a, an effective and affordable and reliable um, and no-brainer almost of, of a solution. So that's kind of where we are, we're at at the minute. As I said, August is, is the first uh, European CubeSat with AI as far as we're aware. Mm. Great to see so much willingness within the innovation in, in this space. Um, a question from, sorry, do you have a comment? 
Um, then another question from Eric Pakin. He asks uh, concerning the warehouse. Does the system optimize storage and routes within the warehouse? So the, the storage and the routes, does it optimize that? Mm, really, really good question. So um, in terms of the storage, uh, there's, as, well, as we understand it from Lenovo, there's actually, uh, this, it's kind of a redundant question because every lane that that, that product is stored in, um, is it fits, uh, I can't remember, is it one or two uh, truckloads of data? So, sorry, truckloads of product. So there's a kind of very direct uh, mapping between a, a truck a truck of, the, of goods that are delivered and an aisle that they're put into. So uh, the aisles tend to be either pretty much empty or full. Now, obviously, as you start removing product on, on the sales side, on the outgoing side, um, you start to empty, uh, partially empty lanes. And so the the... Out, outgoing goods part of the problem is something we haven't even uh, looked at yet because we're, we're still finishing the, the inbound side. Um, in terms of the route optimization, that is a really good question. Uh, at the moment, no, that's not done. There is at least one other company I'm aware of who are, who are working on that. Um, and it is something that with the type of information that, that we're able to generate from this solution, yes, you would expect to be able to do some nice work around um, route optimization. Of course, it doesn't take a genius to see that the next step would be to automate the, the forklifts completely and, and, and take humans completely out of the equation. <laughs> that actually answers one of the, one of the questions from, from Aaron Dorn, who, who's gonna, gonna, who asked, how long till the driver of the forklift is replaced by AI? <laughs> yeah, so uh, the, the reason in this solution that uh, it's not even considered uh, is that Lenovo wanted to have a, uh, wanted to be able to offer a solution to uh, customers that will essentially be able to retrofit into an existing uh, warehousing operation. So there, the, the automation of the forklift driving is, is, is kind of a step beyond because it would require a significant investment in uh, infrastructure or hardware, if you like, from any potential customers. Whereas with this solution, there is a, a small upfront investment uh, centered around the, the camera infrastructure. Um, but other than that, they use the exact same equipment. They've always, equipment they've always been using in terms of the forklifts. They just should have a, a more accurate representation of their stock. It should require less, well, potentially less drivers um, and it's there's less human error so uh, the automation is definitely coming uh, but I think I mean we've probably seen a lot of us have seen the the Amazon warehouse videos uh, they are they tend to be at the moment the roboticized completely roboticized warehouses tend to be designed from the ground up for that purpose so much harder to retrofit but but I think the time will come where they actually can retrofit uh, essentially retrofit an existing forklift to make it autonomous and, and, and that sense then it would be possible to apply it to existing warehouses. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Aubrey, thank you so much for sharing this with us. It's been really, really interesting to follow. Uh, we're receiving some good feedback. People saying thanks. Um, I just want to say if you want to, for you out there, not for Aubrey, but if you want to get in touch with Aubrey, you can visit uh, yobotica.com. And if you're new or just getting started with the topic uh, or interested in applying AI and machine learning to a company, you should join us on the 17th of May for our course, AI Ready. I've posted the uh, links to it and I'll also send out an email with the link for our website. Uh, here, Aubrey will pre be presenting and we'll also be doing a hands-on workshop where you can get to assess your company uh, and from there develop a strategy for how to get started or move on with your AI practices. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this first episode of Learn and Lunch with Talent Garden. And I just wish you a really good day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Marius, and thanks everyone for listening. And bye-bye. Uh, bye-bye, Aubrey. <laughs>